We are filming today a jazz interview for the Hamilton College Archives, and we are here with Benny Powell, one of the great jazz trombone players. Pleasure to have you. Thank you very much. We're here in New York City. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want to ask you some things about jazz, about some things maybe that young people don't know today and see if you can fill us in and, and tell us some things in your career that guided you along the way and some aspects. I also want to talk about some aspects of oral culture. How old were you when you first started playing? Uh, I played drums in grammar school along with Vernel Fournier, who's, who's with Ahmed Jamal's group. I imagine I was about eight or nine when I first started playing drums. And this was just a little parade drum. Uh-huh. Uh, what attracted you to the music? What well, drew, drew you into a musical career? I was born in New Orleans, so that made it easy. Music was everywhere. Uh, and New Orleans uh, has been, is, and has been a tourist city. So in tourist cities, there's much more employment for musicians. Uh -huh. So there were a lot of musicians there, and there still are, because it still is a place of employment. But uh, music was sort of something you did. Uh, everybody in the block had an instrument. Uh, you, it wasn't that much. Well, there were many after-school programs. Dance was one, and music certainly was one, another, and sports. But music fit in with all of that because uh, the bands, well, no, the grammar school band, all we played for was commencement exercises. Uh-huh. And uh, I had an odd experience maybe about two years ago. Uh, after I played little parade drums uh, in grammar school, when I went to high school, I played the bass drum. And I remember one of the uh, pieces we played was Poet and Peasant. This was at Booker T. Washington High School, uh, maybe two years ago, 50 years later after I played Poet and Peasant. I played, uh, as part of the uh, New Orleans Festival, I played uh, a performance at my high school. And uh, I was telling the audience that it seemed in my mind that it had taken me 50 years to get from the space back sort of behind stage to up front. Uh, the last time I was there, I was in the background playing my little bass drum. Now, here I've sort of achieved a little status, and I, it was sort of oh, it was great for me. It was sort of, you know everybody wants to look good in their hometown, so that happened for me. I, actually, to answer your first question, uh, I started playing when I was about eight years old, and I played parade drums. I went to high school and played a bass drum. At about 12, because I know you, I'll anticipate the next question, uh, when did I start playing trombone, because I'm a trombonist. Uh, at about 12, I was at an uncle's house, and as curious as kids are, I was one of, no different. Uh, you know how kids uh, lean backwards on a sofa? And you can see what's behind it, because all kids do that. Anyway, I saw this trombone case behind the sofa. So I uh, as inquired as to what it was, and uh, my uncle told me it was a trombone he had bought for one of his sons, who later decided that he wanted to play sports and not trombone. So I showed an interest in it, so uh, he took it out and uh, let me see it. Then he asked if I would like to uh, take it home or take lessons, and I said yes. And I did, and I studied with uh, a trombonist named Eddie Pearson. He's only on a, a couple of records in New Orleans, but a very fine trombonist. He played in the um, idiom of Trummer Young and uh -huh. 
that kind of that style, very lyrical. Anyway, I was very fortunate to have. Hey, I just noticed that I'm, I'm going to blend into this. <laughs> we had green chairs. You got all green pants. I've got all green. Yeah. It's not funny being green. <laughs> it's not easy being green. <laughs> anyway, uh, I, I guess I should wait for your questions. But if you don't mind, I'll just tell you. No, no, this little, is marvelous. Oh, this is marvelous. Tell you my little story. I played. Um, I studied trombone. At about age 14, uh, someone was needed on Christmas night. They needed a musician to play at the USO during, this was during war, World War II. Now, this is 1944, so mind you, most of the good musicians are in the Army. Or, anyway, what they needed was a warm body in this, the USO band, I guess. And I guess word got around that I could read, so I went to play this job. It was a bunch of older guys. But I was, uh, I was always an egghead. Uh, I guess you find most musicians didn't really fool around with uh, too many toys and stuff. If you discovered music, that's what. Anyway, uh, what did I say that for? I lost my thought. Uh, anyway, I was a kind of serious guy. And I, oh, I know, I studied well. So by the time I was 14, I could read pretty well uh, because I had taken lessons. But they didn't expect me to uh, really um, do too much other than be a 14-year-old kid. But there was a solo. We played stock arrangements, and there was a solo in stock arrangements. This one was by Tommy Darcy. And I think the, the title of the tune was Cheery, Cheery Ben. At any rate, there was a written solo and before we played it, one of the musicians said, you think you can handle it, kid? And I said, yes, I think I can. Anyway, uh, I put my face in the music like I was reading, and I had memorized this Tommy Dawson's solo anyway. And they were impressed with that. They thought, oh, wow, you should have played it good. So that sort of began my career. <laughs> I can remember my career beginning in 1954 at this U.S. show. U.S. No, no, I'm sorry. No, what would that be, 19? 44 at this USO. You know, it's, uh, it's funny sometimes how fate lends you that break you need. Oh, to always get, does. To always get does. Going. In hindsight. Uh, well, I guess this is a, a bit off the, uh, away from our thought, but uh, in Duke Ellington's book, uh, I love the opening of, of the book because I can't remember a quaint can't quote, quote it verbatim, but he said when he first went out his house down the driveway uh, and got to the fence when it was time to go out, there was always there, someone there to tell him which way to go if he wanted to know which, and somewhere, and that happened throughout his career. Uh -huh. He said whenever he needed something, but I guess it's our own awareness that does it anyway. You know, if you're aware, it, something tells you and you're aware of it. If not, they tell you, but <laughs> you're not aware of it, so it doesn't do you much good. Some people say that if you really prepare and you're really good at what you do, your chance will come. Uh, I think a bit of that, but a bit of uh, plain common sense, too, um, realizing, well, I know a lot of musicians believe that. So they think it's not really necessary for them to know business, know how to read contracts, know how to go and get a job because they feel it's good and they'll come. But I, I say perhaps it'll help you to stay in a position uh, after you get there. Uh -huh. But just being good, I've seen too many real good people not go anywhere because they didn't have the whole picture together. In other words, Most of the guys who were successful are pretty good businessmen, are pretty good talkers, uh, and they have other talents other than their play, <laughs> what they play, you know. In other words, they understand the industry, they understand marketing. Yes. Most of, most of all, they understand humankind. They understand people. So, you know, whoever you're talking to, whether you be president or porter, he still 
made of the same thing. He's got two eyes, two ears, <laughs> and uh -huh. stuff, you know. Uh -huh. And I think that's sort of the commonality jazz musicians make among people, because we meet so many people until, and I think we're a little more spiritual than the average person, too. So when we meet somebody, we can vibe right away. We see a lot about that person, you know. Uh -huh. Uh, now, let me let me come in on that. Uh, sure. You talk about the spiritual aspect of it. Um, do you have a church background at all, and does that figure into your music? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't think you can be a musician and not have some kind of religious philosophy. Uh, if you're going to be a creator, you certainly must think of being created. So if you were created there is a, something created you or somebody. So anyway, it teaches you that there's a higher power. So uh, I think musicians just put two and two together like that. And uh, we can't all verbalize exactly what we believe in uh -huh. and stuff. And I'm from New Orleans, and I think I'm pretty spiritual. I know so that some things, I know now that some things can't be explained. Everything doesn't have to be explained. <laughs> right. Some things just are. Right. You beat yourself ahead, you know, <laughs> head against the wall. I'll tell you, uh, for instance, uh, maybe about seven years ago, I went to Morocco with Randy Weston. I've been playing with Randy Weston for about the last 15 years, and it's really been glorious. I've been through. At any rate, uh, this was uh, an affiliation between French, Spanish, and English. Uh, that's the way it was supposed to come out. Uh, it was the story of Randy Weston first going to Tangiers, I think, maybe 25 years ago. He did go to, uh, I don't know how much you know about Randy Weston, but he was a man born in Brooklyn. and maybe about 25 years ago. His father told him that he was um, an African who just happened to be born in, in America. And you know, we've all come around and now we're all African Americans. But his father hit to, to him to that a long time ago. Anyway, he's lived in Africa and played with African musicians. We played Montreal two weeks ago with uh, some people called the Ganawi. Anyway, getting back to my first story, when I went to uh, Tangiers, uh, the people we work with are called the Ganawi, as I said. They used to be the king's orchestra when there still was a king. That was before 1948, when Morocco got its independence or whatever, uh, uh, from under the protectorate. The king gave this band a whole city outside of Tangiers. It's called Suzuka. It had a little prominence during, uh, I think, one of the Rolling Stones. Brian Smith went there and stuff. Arnett Coleman had a little uh, experience there. Anyway, when we're filming Randy's return to Morocco, uh, it was really interesting because we had to. This town, Zuzuka, is about a two-hour drive outside of Tangiers. And somehow Randy had gone there during his visits or something. And it, they were taping uh, a night there. So we got there maybe about 5 o'clock. And this is kind of so remote until the cars couldn't drive up the hill. We had to ride up the hill on donkeys. And that was really very interesting because his six jazz musicians on donkeys, you know, <laughs> you know, that already, that's ingredients for a lot of comedy. <laughs> Al Harewood was the drummer, and Al has short legs, so he kept somehow missing the donkey. <laughs> he would get on the donkey, and his legs weren't enough to grip over, so he'd fall over. <laughs> anyway, he finally got himself situated on the donkey. And these donkeys, I think, for years have been trained to go straight up the hill and stuff. Anyway, this particular day, Al's donkey decided he didn't want to go up the hill. 
So he veers sort of a little to the right, and Al is uh, saying, somebody come and tell this donkey something. Anyway, that was a whole lot of comedy. We finally get up the hill, uh, and the camera crew is setting up stuff. And it's like in this little village with trees and stuff. So uh, they wrap some of the equipment around trees. You know how it is when you're going to do a video shoot. The wires have to go everywhere. Anyway, it just so happened that uh, Randy has his daughter with him at that time. And just before we were about to tape, one of the branches on the trees broke. So it was about a, a lot of conversation about the spirits didn't like something that was going on at this particular place. But it was, uh, it was just one of the adventures. It was pretty wild because it is the place where the whirling devices come from people whirl themselves into a trance. Mm -hmm. All sorts of uh, mis... That's why I said some things can't be explained. You know, some things are like coincidence and so forth. You know, you mentioned another element along with the sense of spirituality that I think is a part of jazz. You mentioned humor. Humor? Yes. Oh, yeah. That's a vital part. I think it's a vital part to life for me. Uh-huh. And it seems like, uh, well, I don't know, maybe birds of a feather drawn together. It seems like most jazz musicians do have terrific senses of humor. I know in Basses Band, it was one big laugh for 12 years. <laughs> you know, everybody was a comedian. Uh -huh. And some really unique humor, because there's unique personalities, you know. Uh, Basses Band was very interesting. I was going to ask you about the Basses Band. Tell us. I joined this band when I was 21. Um, to you, tell you the essence of my experience with Basie. I don't know if it's the essence, but it's certainly the beginning. Um, I was at the Apollo Theater working for a week in Joe Thomas's band. Also in the band was Charlie Folks, who had been with Basie. Basie was on a hiatus, and he was about to form another band. So Charlie Folks told me where the rehearsal was going to be and invited me to the rehearsal. So I went, and um, it was nice, uh, pretty uneventful. I can't remember, you know, what I don't think. I, at this particular time, uh, there were a couple of jobs I wanted. Um, uh, the job with Charlie Ventura, Benny Green had been there, and he was about to leave. So I really wanted a small situation to play in. Then I had uh, waiting to hear from Illinois' jacket also. In the meantime, the basic thing comes up. I make the rehearsal, and uh, that's fine. Charlie Folks tells me when the next rehearsal is. And I come back, and I make that also. I don't know how many rehearsals we did, but pretty soon we started working. And the first date I played with Basie was October 31st, I think. 1951. So I think at this time we would go out of town for maybe one night or two nights a weekend and then come back in town. Well, this went on for just a little while, a couple of weeks. In the meantime, from basically I'm trying to find out if I'm hired, if I have a job or <laughs> Shall I tell Illinois Jacket, uh, you know, I know why. But uh, there was a strange quirk about Basie. If uh, he had something that you wanted, he would sort of play a uh, cat and mouse with you, you know, dangle it in front of you. Anyway, he knew I wanted him to say, yes, Benny, you're hired. Uh, so the first time I... Uh, you know, I was sort of in awe of him anyway. I think I was all of 21, and he was the world-famous Count Basie. So I would sort of find myself next to him by my own design and say, well, Mr. Basie, how do you like the trombone section? It's, uh, it sounds all right. <laughs> and that's all I got out of that conversation. So maybe the next weekend I got brave enough to say, well, uh, 
Mr. Basie, are you uh, satisfied with uh, the trombones? So yeah, they sound pretty good. That's all I got out of that one. <laughs> Next time I went to him, uh, I said, I can't remember each time I would kind of disguise it. But finally, I, I said, uh, well, Mr. Basie, what I'm trying to find out is, uh, you know, am I hired? Am I with the band? He said, you're here, aren't you, kid? <laughs> 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 and every time after that, for about four or five times, that's what I'd get. You hear, aren't you, kid? So finally, I stopped asking him. And during the 12 years, I don't think he ever said, yes, Benny, <laughs> you got a job. You are hired. <laughs> but he was a wonderful band. I loved him. Uh, I was always in awe of older musicians. My dad died when I was seven and I didn't have any big brothers or uncles. So the jazz musicians, Lester Young became my uncle, uh, Illinois Jackett and uh, Dizzy Gillespie and Charlie Parker. So I have some funny stories about the bebop thing. I'm a bebop baby. Although I was born in New Orleans, it was the beginning of 1940s when I was 10 or 11 and so forth that uh, bebop started. So I was deeply interested in bebop. So much so than I wanted to uh, really. And they had uh, all sorts of things. They wore berets and horn uh -huh. rim glasses. And it was more scarves. than just the music, wasn't it? No, it was a culture. It was a whole, yeah, it was. It was a whole, a whole lifestyle. So um, anyway, I saw these horn rim glasses. So I had to have a pair of horn rim glasses. So. I started squinting around and bumping into things and so forth. My mother probably, she was hip to what I was doing. But she finally broke down and bought me some horn rim glasses. So I expected to put on my horn rim glasses and come out and everybody said, wow, look at that bebop musician. Unfortunately, there was a character in the news funnies. We were at war with Japan. His name was Mr. Tojo. Mr. Tojo also wore horn rim glasses. So when I came out expecting to be called Charlie Parker, I said, oh, look at Mr. Tojo. <laughs> I was crushed, but that was by, I went through the whole bit then, you know. I guess that's why I have a beard today, because those guys had beards, you know. I really liked that whole, well, you talk, speaking of a sense of humor, that's what I loved about the bebop so much. Dizzy Gillespie was exactly that, he was nuts. Uh, you know, they say antics. he was a champion prankster. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, there are a couple of. Well, speaking of, I guess one thing triggers another thing. But uh, when I first joined Basie's band, uh, we were just doing little one-nighters and so forth. Uh, then we started doing tours with Billy Eckstein and Ruth Brown. Speaking of pranksters, Billy Eckstein was a major prankster. I guess Dizzy was in his band too. I guess that's where a lot of that stuff came from. We were playing uh, a state-of-the-art hall in Richmond, Virginia. And do you know what a whoopee cushion is? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Billy Eckstein had put one under the pillow that Basie sat on. <laughs> so when he sat down, Oh, can you imagine that, man? <laughs> you know, people would say. Because actually, musicians can, can become like little, we all have little boys left around in us. Yeah. We all, Dizzy Gillespie certainly was one. Uh, boy, I guess I'm full, this evokes a lot of stories. One brings on another one. Uh, Dizzy Gillespie, one time we were in Perugia, Italy, and about two o'clock in the afternoon when we had come into the town and uh, we were going out to get something, some lunch or something, there was a man in the lobby with a puppet on a string. And he was doing nice little things, making the puppet do a lot of stuff. Anyway, Dizzy Gillespie got interested in this thing. So this is about two or three o'clock in the afternoon. And I think he bought it from this guy. So, Dizzy Gillespie, with his creative mind, played with that thing the rest of the 
evening. So about two o'clock in the morning, when we all come back, we're sitting around having some wine and stuff. He had that that uh, puppet doing everything but talking. It was amazing what a creative mind, because he had it. Man, he did make him jump into your pocket. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, oh man! But I always. Uh, saw that quality about him and uh, Basie and Duke Ellington. They were always curious. What's this? What's that? How uh -huh. does that work? Uh huh. Let me let me ask you a couple of questions about that. Uh, do you think that in jazz education today that we're missing something because there aren't these funny little things that yes, find their way into the music? Definitely. Give us an example or, 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 or elaborate on that. Okay. Uh, bands, one of the main ingredients they're missing, I play with some bands and I guess I shouldn't name names, but we um, do maybe the 1940s Ellington uh, book so for recreate that the main ingredient that's missing is fun. Mm -hmm. They don't realize that those guys had fun. Those guys are, you know, sitting up here uh, analyzing every note and uh, mm -hmm. and there is a, a leading scholar now who conducts uh, bands and he explains an eighth note to you. Uh, that's not necessary. Uh, there's a natural quality to the music. Mm -hmm. The music almost dictates to you how it should be played if you let it. If you uh -huh. want to analyze it and put all of that, it comes out some very cold music because it doesn't flow from a natural source. Uh huh. Yeah. So. Um, I want to I want to ask you a question and come come in on that from another little angle here, and that is this: is um, you know I believe that jazz is a manifestation of oral culture. Mm -hmm. And can you give us uh, your concept of what you feel uh, music is when it emanates from oral culture, or draw us any uh, dichotomies or, or parallels or differences between oral culture and literate culture? Because I feel like in much of today's jazz education, it's too dominated by literate culture, by textbooks. Right. Yes. Uh a jazz solo should be like a flow of conversation. Uh, if I would say to you, you dressed nicely today. That's my original st statement. You got on a nice white shirt, and then, then the rest of the solo flows. You make a statement and then reiterate that statement from the kind of jazz I come from. There's another kind of jazz that sounds like mathematics. It sounds like mm -hmm. guys just playing patterns. Mm -hmm. And that's what he's doing a lot of times because uh, when you get, uh, I don't know, concerned with the blues scale and all of that, first of all, before you dealt with the blues scale, you should find out what the blues is or blue. I never did know that was whether that was plural or singular. <laughs> the blues are. <laughs> that doesn't sound right. <laughs> See, must is because must ain't don't sound right. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. I, I, you know, I really, this is a uh, favorite pastime for me. I love talking about jazz because a lot of the things that you're bringing up, I do feel are missing from jazz now. And unless people talk about that and put that back in, when I first joined Randy Weston 15 years ago, he said something that uh, impressed me then and made me understand him. He said, BP, most people like me call me BP. He said, I'm just trying to put the magic back in music. Mm. And boy, can he ever do it. He is a spellbinder. Every gig I played with him has been a whole total experience. He has put the magic back in, I tell you. Um, we're going to do a show for BET next August 8th, I think. I really hope so, because uh, for me, I feel I'm extremely fortunate. Working with Count Basie's band, I've had an amazing career, uh, <laughs> if I do so, so myself. <laughs> uh, because for one thing, it's been interesting to me. I've really loved every second of it. But um, 
after having played with Lionel Hampton, that was my first entrance into big, then Count Basie. I recorded a little with Duke Ellington. Then I did the Merv Griffin show for 10 years. I did Broadway, just did the whole gamut. So I thought by now, uh, on the graph of things, I'd be at the peak and on the downward side. But amazingly enough, it seems like it just keeps going up. And I'm more amazed than anybody. Because Randy Weston, for an instance, he's just like Count Basie. I can't say only better, I guess. Well, the difference is Count Basie's dead, he's alive, you know, <laughs> and still carry. But he's a man who leads by example, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. first of all. And then, uh, for me, it's the greatest platform I've ever had, because playing with bands, big bands are nice. You get a little eight bar solo here, a little mm -hmm. 12 mm -hmm. bar. I think I was known for the bridge I played in April in Paris, because April in Paris became a hit. And I had this little, uh, I don't know, must be eight bars. In big bands, that's all I got a chance to play sometimes. I knew I was going to get a chance to play that solo. But um, now, with this group, there's only, um, for the most part, basically five pieces, two horns out front. So I get a chance to blow until I'm blue in the face. You know, and uh, a lot of it is music I've created myself because when I first joined this band, um, there wasn't really that much written music. Mm -hmm. I had to listen to some records and and sometimes I'd ask, you know, what note uh, goes here? He'd say, I don't know, find a pretty one and play it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. Uh, let me ask you something this. Uh, now, for some people, that type of guidance is too loose. For other people, that's exactly what they want. Well, he knows what he's got. He knows he couldn't say that to anybody. Uh, you know, so I feel like I am chosen by him. Uh, and to make matters better, he pays very well. Uh, if he can't, he performs in all uh, configurations, from solo to symphony. So sometimes, a lot of times, he'll perform with just himself, uh, an alto player, Talib Kibwe, and African percussionist. And uh, he performs all over the world, Venezuela, and oh, this. But if the budget can afford to pay me decently, then uh, I'm added. I'm uh, like the fifth member, I think, that's added to the band. But uh, if he can't pay you what he'd like to pay, he just won't hire you. This is good. I like it, so I know whatever he calls is a well-paying gig and no nonsense. You know? mm -hmm. That's another thing I wanted to ask you about. Uh, the concept, the difference between, as we know it today with, with pop culture, uh, the difference between an artist and an entertainer. Because when I look at some of the earlier great jazz musicians, to me, they were both. Yeah. They, they, what they did was art, it was beautiful, it was mm. so beautifully constructed, and yet it was entertaining. And now it seems like we have entertainers that get paid absorbent amounts of money to sing or play about things that don't have much merit, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, there's mm -hmm. so much raunchiness in today's music. And uh, to me, jazz is a more beautiful form of expression that ha it runs closer to the authenticity of art. Could you talk about that for a moment? Uh, or contrast, or, or compare some of your experiences. Well, it's uh, a little more sophisticated. and. Uh, I think lazy people don't like jazz because they don't want to take the time to really find out anything about it. Um, hmm, how can I address that? Uh, well, it made me think of one thing, and it was not uh, uh, come back to your question. But one time I had to deal with sidemen versus artists. Um, 
or getting side men to look at themselves like artists. And side men might be just a person like myself. I was in a big band and I got a chance to play solos here and there. I became aware of the difference between an artist and a side man when I began. I was a panelist for the National Endowment for the Arts. <laughs> First of all, I was aware this so was the National Endowment for the side man. It was the National Endowment for the Arts. So in order to be funded by it, it's to, be, uh, it's to fund artists. So you have to look at yourself as an artist and then really, well, go to the dictionary and find out what an artist really is if you don't know. And that's what I would suggest because uh, that's one of those words kind of thrown around. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody's an artist. You know, you draw uh, scratches on the sidewalk, you're an artist. <laughs> anyway, I defined artists, uh, the way I defined artists was uh, it's a person who shows responsibility. Uh -huh. uh, you have a responsibility to act like an artist if you're going to be an artist. And then you have to find out who do you think is an artist and check out their behavior and so forth. When we talk about entertainers, we have to sort of put it into some kind of parameters. What kind of entertainer are we talking about? Are we talking about Barbara Streisand, Frank Sinatra, or Tony Bennett? Uh, because there's that kind of entertainer, then there's uh, there are other entertainers, as Victor Borga and stuff. We're still, uh, okay, now, I think you spoke of some commitment to community. Yes, yes. As well. Well, I think those, to me, I don't really worry about that too much. Uh, those who see the validity in it uh, will give something back. There's such an ego trip in all of this until it's very easy to get busy with yourself and forget about all <laughs> others. <laughs> mm -hmm. Maybe for some people it might be the first time they have been able to enjoy some things. Other people might just be power hungry. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think once you start Delving with those millions and millions, I think that is a power thing because let's face it, uh, how much do you really need to live on? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, having thirty billion dollars to me, well, I don't know, it's according to your own philosophy and uh, how you look at it. You know, I would like to see a lot. I would like to be able to do more myself for various charitable things, and I'd like to see more people. Uh, into that, but I don't think I just since some people are going to be adhere to that, some are not. Uh, personally, I hope by the time I die, I can leave something. I'd like to leave some kind of uh, study grant, mm -hmm. or preferably, I would like to be. Uh, part of putting something together that would be here after I'm gone. A jazz class mm. or something that would carry, but something with some monetary value too because I know money is needed to run things. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what it's eventually going to be, but uh, you know, I take my part in various things. Uh, you know, I work on the National Endowment. I have done Sometimes I'm a panelist for the New York State Arts Council, uh -huh. and I just try, I um, call myself a jazz activist because oh. I like to do uh, make people aware of jazz wherever, uh, and I'm capable of it since I uh, am. I guess a well, kind of lecturer now because I've done a program in public schools for at least 30 years called The Story of Jazz. Oh. It's a le lecture demonstration where I trace the origin of jazz from the spirituals to up to its present day and stuff. And I basically break it down very basically. Um, when I go into the classroom, uh, I have a participation thing that's going and I guess I would talk about it now for because I would like to see other people use this. 
when I go into uh, an auditorium, I'll ask uh, how many like jazz with a show of hands, and most of them will raise their hands. And I'll say, thank you, put your hands down. Now I'd like you to be truthful with this next question for me. How many of you don't like jazz? And some of them will kind of sheepishly raise their hands. And I'll say, well, that's fine. Do you part of our reason for being here today? We think people don't know enough about jazz or how it pertains to them. Uh, so that's why we're here, to give some information as to how it got started and what it's made of. And I go on to say that if you would ask me to break it down to its simplest ingredients or com you know, common den denominator, if you will, I'd say it's made of two things. One is rhythm or the what, you know, and they'll, uh, hey, uh, rhythm is, uh, uh, and they'll fool around, and finally somebody will say the beat. Uh -huh. I'll say, yes, that's it. Now, we relate to rhythm because we all have a beat. You know, without it, we'd be dead. Uh, where's the beat? Your heart beats. Okay. So that's why we respond to it. Now, when you hear jazz music played by good musicians, it'll make you feel something because it's a music of deep feeling. It'll make you feel happy if we're playing an up tune, or it'll make you feel sad. So there's two sides to jazz. The happy side of jazz, swing music, bebop, and all that comes from, or the sad side, the blues side. And I'll say the blues is um, a song about a person, a place, or sometimes a consequence. I'll say the first consequence that black people knew of in America kind of, was slavery. So I go on to talk about, you know, if you had to work all day and stuff, you'd have the blues too, uh -huh. you know? Let me, let me ask you a question here. Yeah. You said the music has a happy side to it yeah. and it has a somber side to it. Yes. Can it have both at the same time? Yes, if you write it that way. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, you know, well, uh, Rhapsody in Blue is not a jazz tune, but that sort of has a, well, you know, there's sweets. If you write a suite of tunes, that uh -huh. tune. But for the most part, it's either one or the other. It's either blues tune, uh, a song about I shot my baby or my baby's gone or my baby ain't got no hair or something. <laughs> it's, it's a story about a thing. So uh -huh. back to the story of a consequence. The first uh, blues that we knew was Negro spirituals. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows the troubles I've seen. That's the blues. It sure is. The blues is anything you want to, you know, uh, that's what most blues are about, everybody, people's troubles. Uh -huh. So I'll do that. And then um, my band, we play, and nobody knows. Uh, then the band's still playing behind me. And I'll talk about uh, life under slavery. And I usually say that I don't know what slavery is like. I'm standing up here in an Italian suit and with my gold rings on and stuff. You know, I'm certainly a long way from a slave. But in order to know my history, I went to the library to read books about it. And there was one book that I related to uh, there was one instance in a book that I related to. And I'll say, uh, you know, slaves aren't supposed to learn to read or write, yet there was one man born in slavery who became so proficient at it until um, he became an editor of a newspaper. That was Frederick Douglass. Yes. And I'll say, in his book, he said at uh, one time, he got a chance to see his, he only got a chance to see his mother seldom in his life. And she had to walk 20 miles in darkness each time. So I said, well, for me, how I relate to that is my dad died when I was seven, so my mother was my mentor. And every time I needed to know something, I'd go, and my mother would tell me, you know. I even went to and said, can I go traveling on the road at 16? And she was always there for me. So I said, slavery for me would have been not to have access to my mother, well, freedom or anything. Mm -hmm. But I really would relate to that part of it, of it you know. Let me, let me ask you this. Sure. I want you to come in on this. <clears throat> that is, um, 
I know I feel this, is that when I listen to gospel music, or I listen to rhythm and blues, or I listen to jazz, uh, even though I do enjoy the musics tremendously, it seems to go to some place inside of me deeper than that because the music for me is need-based. I actually need, if I were to spend a year without hearing any jazz, no R&B and no gospel, I think I'd become ill. That's why I didn't ever move to Europe like an expatriate. I kept on wanting to move to Europe, you know, like Benny Bailey and Art Farm, a lot of those guys did. Uh, I, and I kept procrastinating. Finally, I got a chance to, I played Ain't Misbehaving, I lived in Paris for, for eight months. But I checked myself and I wondered why I didn't do it. But it was that same thing. If I woke up hearing, King de fling de flung de flung de flung, I need to hear some B.B. King. I need to hear some Aretha Franklin, some Stevie Wonder, some Dizzy Gillespie, some John Coltrane. And if I did that for a year, I don't think I would have been the same, I uh, think. Uh, I believe my playing would have suffered first. But that's the same point that you have. The, 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 you, know, you know, the thing is, you talked about uh, the aspects of slavery, and that was an aspect of denial or deprivation or the stopping you from getting to specific resources that you needed. One, you said, was, if you were thinking in terms of your mother, you were thinking of this person who's a resource for you, who basically in African society took the place of a griot. Yeah. And so she was your source of knowledge and a source of inspiration, motivation. Mm -hmm. You know, and so sometimes well, I, I personally feel that when I'm deprived of something, I use the one thing I do have to try and better my scenario. That's my musical gift, mm -hmm. which makes me play out stronger in a way that's more authentic than just because I knew the scale out of that t textbook. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, I want to ask you, we're going to kind of wrap up our interview here. Uh, if you have any specific things you'd like to say in closing about jazz education or, or that you, you mentioned you'd like to leave something behind to young people, could you leave us with a statement to inspire or guide young musicians today? Well, there are a couple of things. First of all, I would like to have America realize the validity of jazz. Jazz is an art form, and when I go into schools, I'll ask, what are other art forms? Painting, symphonic music, uh, ballet, uh, many things. But all of those started somewhere else, another continent. Jazz started right here in America. So, as Americans, we should all know something about jazz and be proud of it. On the prejudice side, I don't think, I personally don't think white America has ever given black America any credit for anything en masse. Mm -hmm. It was George Washington Carver and Martin Luther King and all of that. That's, that's gotten credibility. But black people started jazz. We've never been given credit for it. In fact, it has hurt jazz because it was started by black people. Had it been started by white people, I think it would have had a much easier road. I'd like to see America finally said yes, say yes, the black man did create a culture that has spread all over the world and everybody enjoys it now but is a black creation. I think that would help a lot of, nothing like that has ever been done. And therefore, we still have the same old racial problems over and over, over and over. And you keep on asking people, well, Negro, what do you want? He said, I just want you to recognize me, recognize that I'm some, well, black man, what do you want? I just want you to recognize me and stuff. Well, uh, nigga, what do you want? I just want you to recognize me and stuff. It's all the same. but. America uh, keeps on right now with the affirmative action and all of that. Um, they can't set stuff backwards. 
the law of divine law is not going to let it go backwards. Anyway, that's getting off from, uh, for young people, I'd say whatever you do, find something that you honestly like to do. Mm -hmm. And then it'll become uh, a strong force in your life. Right now, I'm a dialysis patient. I have to go for dialysis three times a week uh, because I don't have proper kidney function. My kidneys don't function. Uh, I would perhaps like to get a transplant sometimes, and I'll be fine. But being a musician has been therapeutic for me. Um, when I'm playing, I'm well. Mm. Nothing is wrong with me. Mm. And I'm fortunate enough uh, to still play strong and still keep my uh, notch, whatever I've carved, you know, on the world-class level. I think I'm, you know, one of the ten kind of recognized trombone players in the world. Well, I'm fortunate uh, that the creed has given me enough strength to be able to uh, maintain this. So, if you, whatever it is that you go into is something that you like doing, at some point in your life, it may become therapeutic for you, just as music is therapeutic for me. It's as healing for me as any of the medicine I mm. ever take. So I guess it's do something that you really like to do. Find something that you really, don't make your life's work something you hate. <laughs> you know. One person said if you if you do something that you love, you technically never have to work another day in your life because it's a love affair. Yeah, right. I don't just like <clears throat> dialysis for me. I've never had a nine to five in my life. When uh, my kidneys uh, broke down, and I had to start dialysis, that was maybe about uh, three or four years ago. Uh, no, it must, must have been maybe a little before that. At any rate, what I did, I go to the hospital three times a week, three and a half hours. I made this my nine to five. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's never any days when I feel like I don't want to go and stuff. It's just like, you realize you got to go to work. I realize I've got to do this. So it doesn't even interfere with my life. You know, I go and do that. And in fact, I do it all over the world. I've dialyzed in East Germany and it's become an adventure. <laughs> so, uh -huh. but the main thing is be happy. Yes, yes. I would like to just say as we close here uh, that these interviews with some of the greatest living jazz musicians there are have come about particularly to rectify some of the injustices that have been done to African American musicians. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would like to see that taken care of, and I would like to see people get their due. And when I was asked to participate on these particular interviews, someone asked me about that, and I broke down in tears, and I said, these people need their respect. And so I, I, I believe and I trust that even as we're looking into this camera right now, you're getting some that you, you richly deserve. <laughs> oh, well, I'll tell you, uh, the fact that you allowed me to be able to voice it uh, means that it's possible to change. Mm -hmm. If I didn't get a chance to voice it, nobody gets a chance to see it. Certainly that's just my idea. And I would, maybe I could walk around a bit of old man because nobody won't listen to me. Or but, once you put an idea out there, and especially an, an institution of learning, there's no telling where that idea can go because exactly. if it's, that's why uh, I guess when we all do these interviews, we try to, try to do them as purely as possible yes. and give as honest answers without, oh, we're all tactful, we know how to be politicians, <laughs> but uh, we hope that we can really impart some of our true feelings, and you've given me the opportunity to do that, so I thank you for it. Yes, and thank you, and that concludes our interview with Benny Powell.